watching the award-winning GHS-TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome to this week's edition of GHS TV's award winning talk show, Crosstalk. I'm your host, Caitlin Poindexter. Each week, we discuss topics important to our diverse community. As COVID 19 continues to threaten Americans, there is some hope in sight. The FDA has approved Pfizer's vaccine for emergency use, and a second vaccine from Moderna should be approved soon. After the Herculean effort to approve a vaccine, now comes the even harder part administering the vaccines. Here to talk more about the county's COVID numbers and the vaccine distribution plan is Dr. Elisa Househalter, Director of the Shelby County Health Department. Dr. Househalter, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for having me here today. The big news of the week is the FDA approval of the COVID-19 vaccine. When will Shelby County see its first vaccinations or have they already happened? Uh, we'll actually be seeing our first vaccinations later this week. The hospitals will receive vaccine first, and they're scheduled to start vaccinating their team members either late Friday or over the weekend. And then the health department will begin later this month. Well, earlier this month, Tennessee released its own vaccination plan. Can you talk about who gets it first, second, et cetera, and where do you go to get it? Uh, it's a great question. Um, the vaccine will be rolled out in phases. So the first phase is 1A1, and that is for healthcare workers, EMS providers, and other first responders, those in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities, but primarily those who are most at risk of being exposed or spreading it to others. And then as we move into the first part of next year, there'll be other high-risk populations, including individuals who are seniors and those who have chronic illnesses. And then the general public will be spring. I'm sorry, general public no, 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 will be I'm spring. Sorry. That's okay. Where do people need to go to get the vaccine? So there'll be a variety of places where people can get vaccine. Um, clearly, if they work in the healthcare system, they can get it there as an employee. But over time, actually healthcare providers, so your regular uh, primary care provider will have vaccine. Pharmacies will have vaccine and the health department. So for right now, what I've encouraged people to do is keep up with information to know what risk group they fall into and when they're eligible to get vaccine. And then first try to work through their primary care provider. And if it's not available there, then they may be able to come to the health department or some other community provider. How long do you think it will take to vaccinate all of Shelby County? Uh, we actually plan to be giving vaccine well into 2021. So the goal would be to vaccinate a large portion, 70% or more of the population um, by summer, but we know that we'll continue to give vaccine after that as well. Well, the Pfizer vaccine requires two doses in order to be fully effective. How can you ensure people are receiving both doses? So there's a variety of ways to make sure people get uh, both doses. Uh, one of that is obviously giving them notice um, early on that they're going to have to have two vaccines, but also using technology to make sure that people are aware when their second dose is due. The Moderna vaccine also requires two doses, so there'll be a lot of logistics um, trying to make sure that people get notice and are sure that they come get their second vaccine. As more vaccines are approved over time, will it matter which one a person needs to get? So all vaccines, when they're approved, have met certain um, safety criteria and what we call efficacy or effectiveness criteria. So it doesn't really matter ultimately which one a person gets. However, what is important is that if you get a vaccine that requires two vaccinations, that you get the same one the second time that you did the first one. So if you get Pfizer vaccine on number one, you have to get Pfizer on number two. 
if you get Moderna on number one, you get Moderna on number two. And some of the uh, vaccines that are in progress now actually will only require one vaccine. And so some people, if they later get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, if it's approved, that would be one vaccination. Well, we are two weeks past Thanksgiving where people ignored CDC guidelines about traveling and gatherings. Is Shelby County seeing a surge of cases in response to this? Yes, we've had an increase in cases over the past week, um, and that is, in our opinion, a result of the Thanksgiving Day surge that we had anticipated. The new county guidelines that are put in place before Thanksgiving were meant to stop the spread. What factors do you take into account when determining these guidelines? Oh, you're asking the really good question now, is we have to take into account many different things. Um, one is what's the state of the pandemic? And then based on the interventions, which ones are um, evidence-based or science-based and are likely to impact transmission? Then we also have to look at where we actually have authority. So for example, we know that there is some transmission in households because of gatherings but we have no authority to tell a person what to do inside their home. So we can only make recommendations. And so you balance all of those and you have to look at not only the science, but the math. If we um, do an intervention, is it gonna reduce transmission amongst a large enough portion of the population to have a population level impact? So science and math are important. Some say that the guidelines or restrictions don't go far enough. What do you say to those people? I appreciate people's perspective on that. And um, there is a, it is a balancing act of how do we make sure we reduce transmission and have minimal impact on not only the economy, but society in general, schools and other things. And so there's a middle ground and there are always individuals who think they should be less restrictive or more restrictive. What if one wanted to go to the gym or wanted to go out and celebrate with friends? What can you do to stay safe? So the first thing you want to do is get tested yourself. It's really important to know your status. We have a lot of testing capacity in Shelby County, and there's no charge for testing. So we really encourage people to get tested, particularly if they're going to um, have an event or socialize over the holidays. The other is to make sure you limit the number of people that get together. Should be less than 10, but also you should try to limit to your immediate household only. If you are going to be larger than that, then two households and no more, but clearly making sure that people are tested. For a gym, that's a little bit different. You want to also know on a regular basis if you um, have COVID or not. So if you're symptomatic, don't go to the gym. But also if you get tested, you'll know your results. And then lastly is to wear a face mask while in a gym. And it's been difficult for some people to understand the importance of that. But gyms are very high risk facilities for transmission because when you're working out, you're breathing heavier. And so you're more likely to transmit the virus in that setting. Well, Dr. Househalter, thank you for all the work you've been doing. I appreciate the time we spent together today. Oh, thank you so much for having me and you have a great holiday. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we will dive deeper into what we know about COVID-19 and the vaccines developed to end the pandemic. GHSCV started in 1982, and it was just a couple of cameras, a couple of on-air personality, and it's really grown into what you see today. It's a multi-million dollar studio with top-of-the-line technology. Being able to operate you know, all of the machinery in the control room, uh, being able to use all of our software and hardware that we have around the studio uh, is a great skill because this is top-of-the-line equipment. I feel like this class has brightened my horizon. It's something that I never thought I would be doing, um, especially as a student. GHS TV is probably one of the most hands-on experiences a student will ever get in their lifetime. Welcome back to Crosstalk. Nothing really has just the vibe that we have here. Especially after you finish, you get a real rush of, wow, I just did that. By the time a student graduates from Germantown High School, they will know pretty much every position there is. 
from producing to directing um, to on-air work. You learn time management, you learn organization, you learn how to work with people, how to better communicate with people. We put a lot on them and they have to be able to have the responsibility and the knowledge to get everything that we ask them. I had very little experience, uh, so in the past three years, the skills that I've learned have, have absolutely exponentially grown. The class has actually helped me figure out that I want to go to college for journalism. When a student graduates, they are the best possible version of themselves that they can be. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. For more information about the Kappa program, visit GHSKappa.com or call 755-7775. You're watching the award-winning GHS-TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to Crosstalk. The COVID-19 pandemic is unlike anything we have seen in our lifetime. The race to develop a vaccine has been a top priority for the U.S. medical community since the first reported cases. Dr. Stacy Schultz-Cherry, an infectious disease expert from St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, joins me now to help us understand the virus and the vaccine. Dr. Schultz-Cherry, thank you very much for taking the time to join me virtually today. For the opportunity, and I apologize for the technical glitches, and I, and I assure you I'm not driving in my car. I'm just sitting in my car. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, well, we now have an approved COVID-19 vaccine. Did you ever think in March when the virus hit the area that we would have a vaccine by the end of the year? We were all hopeful because while it seems like the vaccine was very rapid and it, it was in many ways, um, a lot of that was from Operation Warp Speed, which was funded um, you know, funding from the US government to speed things up. But many of these platforms um, and actual vaccines have been in the works for many, many years, which is why, while it was rapid, it was a very long process to get to where we are today. Well, these vaccines are a new type of vaccine called mRNA. Can you talk about what makes them unique and the unheard of effort to develop them? Sure, and it's important to note that these vaccines, the mRNA-based vaccines, have been in the works for many, many years for lots of different um, viruses and bacteria. So what it actually is, is taking a piece of basically nucleic acid or the building blocks that your body uses to make a protein. That is um, the basis of the vaccine. It's injected into you and your body then makes those natural proteins against the um, SARS that your body would make antibodies to anyway. So it's it's a very, very clever vaccine in that your body is mounting those natural responses to the part of the uh, virus that would get expressed if you were infected, but there's nothing infectious in it. Um, you can't get SARS from it. It is just a little piece of building block of DNA. What do you look for when deciding whether a vaccine is successful or not? Well, first thing is safety. That is the most important factor we look for when we're making vaccines is, is it safe in the populations that you're targeting? And that is done through many, many um, called phased clinical trials where you look for side effects in many thousands of people. And then once you have, you know it's safe, what you're looking for is either that you mount very good um, responses against that virus so that you have protective responses or that it actually blocks you from getting infected with the virus completely. The other thing we can look for is that if you were to get infected that the vaccine would reduce the disease that you actually have. So there are several different measures that you can look for, but number one is safety. Many people are concerned about the quickness of the vaccine development and trial phases. What do you say to those who may be hesitant to get the vaccine? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that um, people need to understand that these vaccines and, and the platforms that are being used have been in um, 
basically being developed for, I think for the mRNA back vaccine, I've heard 17 years. So they've been through clinical trials, the adenovirus-based vaccines, like the ones from AstraZeneca and Janssen, you know, we use those same sorts of adenoviruses for cancer therapy. So while it seems like we very rapidly went from we have a SARS pandemic to we have a vac vaccine, those vaccines that we're using, the platforms have been tested for many, many years, which is important because that shows that they're safe and effective. Earlier, you mentioned phased clinical trials. How has St. Jude contributed to the research on the virus and the vaccine? Oh, great question. So St. Jude, we are doing, um, you know, we're, we're looking at responses that people have to infection, to the vaccine. And as you've seen on the news that St. Jude is actually um, participating in one of the clinical trials for the AstraZeneca or the Janssen vaccine. So we are, you know, very important to us that we're not just protecting our patient population, but that we're protecting the community. And we're doing that by, you know, trying to understand more about SARS and what's the best way to protect yourself from it. What have we learned about COVID-19 since February, March, and what answers are we still looking for? Well, we've learned um, that when people do get infected, that they make very strong host responses that will protect them. We've learned a lot about um, how this virus is transmitting and that we could have super spreader events where you have, you know, a, an area or a situation where many, many people get infected. We know that it came from an animal but we don't know what animal species, we don't know how it crossed from animals, what happened. So there's still a lot to learn because there are a lot of coronaviruses still out there in nature and we need to understand much more about them so that we can either predict or prevent another SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. How can we as a country be better prepared for the next viral outbreak? Well, you know, there's always going to be a next one. There's always going to be a new strain of flu. You know, we expect flu pandemics about every 30 years. So we need to um, listen to our public health officials, listen to the scientists. Um, you know, if there's a vaccine available, get the vaccine. If it's safe for you, your doctor, doctor recommends it, do it. If, if, there are public health measures that you can take, wearing a mask or social distancing. You can do that. One thing that we've seen that I'm not sure we would have ever predicted is that this year we're having very little to no influenza circulation. And it's likely because of the measures that we're taking to prevent SARS, which is social distancing, it's wearing a mask, it's actually helping us to reduce influenza in the community. So I think that's a really important message is that, you know, maybe wearing a mask was our miracle medical intervention for an emerging or re-emerging respiratory infection is you can stop that transmission just by wearing a mask. Well, Dr. Schultz, Terry, this was a fabulous conversation. Thank you for all the hard work you do and thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much and I apologize. I thank you for your patience. Have a great holidays. You as well. After the break, we will discuss current treatments for hospitalized COVID patients. We have four major vocal ensembles at Germantown High School. There's a large chorale with about 50 to 60 students, a women's chorus, our chamber choir, which is an elite ensemble of 18 singers, and a contemporary a cappella group, which is about 16 singers. It's really nice to be in a room full of people who share your passion and who want to learn and make every song as beautiful as it possibly can be. I really try to instill in my students the importance of connecting with the literature, that they have to go outside of the box and actually understand what they're singing about. Thank you. This program has really pushed me. Um, it's shown me a lot of my insecurities and how to grow past those. Many times we'll gather around the piano 
to build that sense of camaraderie, to be able to hear each other better, to interact with each other and make music together. Work together, hold that solid. Then we genuinely love music. We sing because we want to and not because our Mr. Hainer is telling us. Two beats, you come in. One and two. two. Music empowers us to come together as a group. I feel like this generation has become so focused on me, 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 me. And music is us, 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 us. For more information about the Kappa program, visit ghskappa.com or call 755-7775. watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Caitlin Poindexter. Local hospitals are feeling the strain again as the post-Thanksgiving COVID-19 surge continues. As our knowledge of the virus has changed, so too have the treatments. Here to explain the care COVID-19 patients receive, is Dr. Shinello Animalu, Infectious Disease Specialist from UT Health Science Center. She also treats patients at Methodist University Hospital. Dr. Animalu, I'm very excited to be talking with you today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Hospitals around the country are starting to see the expected post-Thanksgiving COVID surge. What are you seeing in your hospital right now? So we have seen exactly the same surge. Uh, most of our ICUs of um, all the local hospitals here are almost at full capacity with COVID positive patients. So we are also experiencing exactly the same surge in this area. If it gets really bad, would there start being a rationing of care? Well, uh, remember that this is also the flu season. Uh, so in addition to the COVID, 19 patients coming in. We also have to cater for other patients that come in and around this season with maybe COPD exacerbation, influenza, and all respiratory infections that also require a um, very high level of care. So it's actually a challenge um, to take care of this in addition to our regular patients with other uh, respiratory illnesses. How has the treatment for COVID patients changed over the past nine months? So there's been tremendous uh, work done in that area. Uh, we have the remdesivir, which is the only FDA approved uh, medication for COVID-19 that's used uh, mainly in hospitalized patients uh, who require supplemental oxygen. In addition to that, we now have at least two monoclonal antibodies um, available to our outpatients uh, with COVID-19. These are patients basically that have mild to moderate um, illnesses that can quickly progress to severe illnesses. So the use um, of this monoclonal antibodies that are now available is something that would kind of help halt that progression to severe disease as well as hospitalization. So this has been an amazing, amazing um, improvement in the last couple of months. Speaking of remdesivir, it was just approved last month by the FDA. Can you talk about how the drug works in layman terms? Sure. So um, the virus um, itself, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes the corona, um, the COVID-19 illness, uh, basically works in two ways. The first is where the state, the virus replicates, meaning the virus, you know, tries to, you know, multiply. And that is the stage where uh, remdesivir works. It's basically an antiviral medication. So what it does uh, um, is when it's given early in the disease, usually within 10 days, um, it helps to prevent replication of the virus. Now, um, for those patients that maybe we're unable to get treatment or they quickly progressed to severe illnesses and they require hospitalization, they require use of supplemental oxygen or they need to be intubated, 
Then, in addition to remdesivir, they might end up requiring dextamethasone, which is a steroid. How will treatments change now that we have an approved vaccine? Oh, um, now that the vaccine, this week basically is the first week that most places all around the country are beginning the active process of vaccination. Right now, being targeted um, to that population, basically um, those that are front uh, liners, like the emergency room physicians and nurses and doctors. Um, that take care of COVID patients, respiratory therapists, and as well as nursing home residents or people that live in commuted um, environments. So we're still continuing with our active treatment because it's going to take a while for the entire population um, to get vaccinated. So right now it's just a small number of people, those in the front lines that are receiving the vaccination. So treatment is still very, very important because we still have those, we can see what's happening all over the country. People are being admitted thousands a day. So we still need those treatment uh, modalities available for them. Is the lack of personal protective equipment for doctors and nurses still an issue? Well, for I can speak for uh, facilities here um, in the Memphis and greater Memphis areas. Uh, we've been lucky that so far, we have adequate PPEs available to frontliners. So hopefully uh, this will continue, especially now with the vaccination in place. So unlike that initial time um, around the March, April, May area, where there was acute shortage of PPEs now, we do have um, PPEs available. And so we're thankful for that. We haven't yet touched on the effect of nurses and medical professionals. What toll has this pandemic had on you, the nurses, and the other ICU staff? So this has actually tried uh, most of us to the core. And um, this is a reminder of what we have signed up to do. And it's taken a lot of emotional and psychological toll on most of us that have to for these patients. Um, you know, so this is a part that people actually don't see, you know, where you have to watch your patients die, you know, as, as a physician myself, it's always a loss when you lose a patient. So it comes with its own emotional and psychological toll. I have kids at home and so every day I come home, I'm trying the best I can to sanitize myself to make sure I don't bring this virus um, back home from the hospital to the house. So it's it's a lot. It takes a lot of uh, each and every one of us. Well, Dr. Animalo, this was a great discussion. We thank you for all the hard work you have done to save lives. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for having me and stay safe. Again, thank you to all our guests for coming on today's show. The information they provided is so crucial as we move into the next phase of this pandemic. For more information on our programming, please check us out on the web at ghstv.org, where we are streaming live 24 hours a day. You can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Caitlin Poindexter. From all of us here at GHS TV, thank you for watching Crosstalk, and I hope to see you again.